I just wanted to say I'm so happy to see your faces. I'm so happy that you have been able to uh, go online. It is so important for us to stay connected and we're hoping that we can develop this program for the Waldemir group, people that have showed up at Waldemir at various times and really enjoy each other and possibly do some demonstrations or make uh, a garment or whatever. But we're going to really start looking at having Zoom faces. We are not doing very well in Florida as far as social distancing. Dist I can't say that word. Distancing. Distancing. Anyway, people are still, or I think that they're immune to this virus and they're not. So with that, uh, Sandy has been so generous to um, gather some information together for us and some videos that we think will uh, enhance your sewing at home. And uh, I'll talk to you more in a little bit. Hi, I'm Cheryl Belson with American Sewing Guild, and I am so happy today to be joined by Gail Yellen of Gail Patrice Designs. Gail offers a collection of skirt, tee, and accessory patterns, and all of them are designed with embellishment opportunities in mind. Gail also teaches a wide range of classes, both in person, when we can do things like that again, as well as online, including two of those being on Blueprint. She's the author of the book, Serger Essentials, and she has a YouTube channel where she has a wide range of videos called Serger Tip Clips. And Gail is a longtime member of American Sewing Guild. Yay. So as you can tell, Gail is, uh, well, under normal circumstances, you're quite the busy bee. So I feel very lucky to get this time with you. Welcome, Gail, and thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for inviting me, Cheryl. I'm, I'm delighted to be here and I applaud your efforts for keeping us all connected during our, our social distancing time and hopefully that'll come to an end when it's the right time to do it. Absolutely. Well, let's just dive right into a couple of questions so we can get to know a little bit more about you and about what you do. Um, so I understand that your own personal journey into sewing began after a 20 year career as a dental hygienist? That's yep. uh, quite a career shift. <laughs> well, it is. And um, I've always said, um, I've always had very good fine motor skills, but my athleticism ends right here. <laughs> and um, so I've always been drawn to things that require good fine motor skills. I played guitar when I was a kid and I love dental hygiene. I have a degree in English that I got before I went um, back to school in Boston for dental hygiene, but um, I loved it. And you know, one day it occurred to me that every time I had reached a milestone, I would reward myself with something with sewing. When I graduate, when I got my undergraduate degree, I bought a, I think I, it was a $25 or $50 a secondhand sewing machine. And I sewed with that for a bunch of years. Then when I finished um, dental hygiene school, I went and bought another sewing machine that was a little bit better. And um, then I had that for about, I don't know, probably, well, probably for about 20 years. And then I said, you know, I think I should see what's new and different. And at that point, believe it or not, I was still at the point sewing where I used a needle till it bent or broke. That's what I thought you did. And um, I can remember going into a local sewing machine dealership, which sadly is no longer around, but um, I saw these machines doing embroidery. <laughs> it was like, whoa. <laughs> I didn't even know they had machines that did that. And I honestly, I can still remember thinking, who the heck needs that? And um, so I ended up buying a mid-range machine. And um, the store had a lot of wonderful, wonderful classes. And there was one that um, was a triple needle pillowcase that had a million different decorative stitches on it. And when I was picking up my machine, I went over, they, we had all the samples. They used to have all the samples pinned on the wall. And I said, well, what's that stitch? Does my new machine do it? And I did this about six times. And I think they finally got sick of saying, yes, it'll do it. It's this stitch. And one of the women said, well, you know, you need to take the sewing machine basics class. 
and I was highly insulted because, <laughs> because I had sewn for about 20 years. But I said, oh, well, what, when is it? And so they said, it's this Saturday. And I said, is there room in the class? And they said, yes. So I paid and I went over and it was um, an all day class. And, you know, sometimes you can point to a day in your life that's transformative, good or bad. And that was the day for me. And I came home. It was kind of a rainy, drizzly, yucky Saturday. And I got home and my husband said, well, how was your class? And I said, I said, I, I, it was like somebody pulled back the curtains and it was a whole new world. And I said, I learned more in six hours than I knew in 20 years. And the biggest thing I learned is I don't know how to sew. <laughs> so um, it was, it really truly was a transformative day. And that's what got me hooked on taking classes. And um, I went within nine or 10 months from saying who the heck needs a machine that does embroidery to buying one so <laughs> so it really was a different day and I just loved it and then I had stopped working so I had time to take a lot of different classes and just do a lot of the things that I didn't have when I was employed full-time and I um was at the store so much they eventually asked me to work for them so that kind of got me going into um uh, what I call my accidental career. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love to hear the stories that people have to tell about how they got into what they're doing. So, well, I mentioned in your intro that all of your designs are created with an intentionality of providing sort of a, a, a canvas for being creative and adding embellishments. And as I heard you tell your story, I heard that you quickly got intrigued with embroidery, which is another form of embellishment. So you seem to have quite a passion for that kind of creativity. What, um, what drives that passion? Well, um, I think what did it in the beginning was I started off with very simple patterns, um, very simple jackets. And when I was at the store, I realized that a lot of people were very intimidated about the idea of making a jacket, as was I at probably um, a little bit before that. And I thought, well, you know, why don't we start with sweatshirt jackets? Because that way you haven't invested a lot of money in really, you know, couture um, fabric kind of like Julian Dorcas and um, but and if it comes out well then great and if it doesn't who cares because it's a sweatshirt and so I started using that and then I um, used a lot of my built-in stitches and again along the line as I started taking more and more classes um, my brain kind of transitioned from sewing as strictly utilitarian because as I said before that I was kind of of the mindset that you sew, like if I needed new curtains, you made curtains. And if I needed a new skirt, I made a new skirt. But as I saw what other people, and we had a phenomenal customer base at the store, as I saw what they were doing, it really occurred to me that sewing was an art form, just like painting or sculpture or anything else. And um, so I started trying to think of different ways to use um, my built-in decorative stitches on that first machine. It was just a mid-range Janome that I had bought. And as I said, it didn't have embroidery. So I started using those, which are really beautiful. And I think a lot of us underutilize and underestimate how nice they are as an embellishment and that you don't have to have um, a top of the line machine to do some really pretty decorative techniques. But um, then when I got an embroidery machine, I saw all sorts of different things. And from taking classes and looking at what other people were doing and seeing what, what they were up to and how they used it, I said, sewing really and truly is an art form. And I think that's what intrigued me was that I thought of it more as art and then art to wear, which I've always really, really liked. When I started doing some of the expos around the country and I had a trunk show with a lot of the different techniques that I had dreamed up myself, um, people said, are those all included in the pattern? And I said, well, no. And then 
after so many people asked, somebody said to me, you should really write a book, which I did. And um, I had it printed twice and I sold out of it. And I think I might make it online. I, you know, I might make it a PDF that people could look at. I, I love embellishing. I love playing and experimenting. And you don't see all of the, the things that don't quite work out the way I want them to do. That those are in the trash. But um, it's all part you know, of the <laughs> it well, it is. It is. So um, it is practice. Now, whenever I think of Gail Helen, um, and probably I will think of you in a more expanded way now that we've had time together. But I have seen so much recently of you doing work with Serger. Uh -huh. And so I think of Gail Yellen and I think of Sergers. And um, I believe you've actually taught several Serger classes um, for ASG conference and some, some American Sewing Guild um, uh, opportunities. So can you tell us how you ended up so engaged in this type of sewing? Well, um, going back to when I was just starting, like maybe that first year that I was starting to take classes, um, and I'd go over to the store and I'd take my sewing machine and we'd take my class. And of course, sometimes they could run, um, you know, one class after another or two simultaneously. And sometimes it would be a serger class. And I would see people coming in with their sergers and, you know, I truly... Um, when I would look at those machines, and I'd see four columns of thread on them. I would just about start hyperventilating because I thought, oh, how, how can anybody even learn those things? They look so intimidating. And then the more I started thinking about it, I thought, well, if they're made for the home sewing market, they can't be impossible to learn. So I thought, well, um, maybe I'll investigate. So I went over and um, I went over to the store and this is again before I started, long before I started working for them. And I had just planned to buy kind of a mid-range serger because I didn't know anything about them and I didn't know whether I'd like them or not. And um, I had the saleswoman show me and demo a mid-range serger. And then I said, well, can you show me um, a top of the line serger and tell me what the difference is. And it was a computerized serger and um, it auto set the tensions and you could change the stitches and all of that. So that's what I ended up going home with. And so um, I played with it and my husband happened to be away that weekend. I could just play with my new machine. And that's what I did all weekend. And um, so I, I did that and I got very confident by Sunday night that I was sure I knew how to thread it and do all of that. So I just very, you know, boldly snipped off all the threads and went to rethread it. Well, then I couldn't get it to stitch. <laughs> so I had to call the store and make an appointment, go over, have them show me again. And I, it was practice after that. But um, eventually something in my head clicked for oh, this is what the upper looper does. This is what the lower looper does. This is what the stitch finger does. And suddenly all the pieces started falling in line. And that's when I realized that once you understand the components on a serger and what they do and how they affect the stitch, that's when you can really have fun with it and not worry about it um, going crazy or, or breaking anything. And, um, that's what I try to stress in my in-person classes as well, that once you understand the machine, you, you're home. You can do anything you want. So um, going a little deeper into this serger topic, uh, to, I want to talk to, want you to talk to us just a little bit about the collection of videos that you have on YouTube, your serger tip clips that you've developed. Um, I started doing those a few years ago. I think I started those maybe about four or five years ago. And I just thought um, it would be kind of nice to have little 
short videos of one tip or one technique um, that wouldn't take too, too long to um, do a video on. And I've tried to keep them shorter than 15 minutes. I thought, well, if I keep them fairly short and just kind of bite-sized clips, um, it will be easy for people to follow along and then they can just click on the tip clip that they want or the technique or the specialty foot or attachment and they can go back and replay it. So that, that was where that idea came from. That's a great idea. And I spent a little bit of time wandering your YouTube channel and uh, you do have quite a lineup out there. So um, you have sent me two little snippets from uh, two different clips. So let's take a look at those now. So I'm gonna put that little starting gate right up by the knife. I press her foot down and start stitching. And I'm just going to stitch around and just kind of skim off a tiny, tiny, scant eighth inch of the edge. So I'll go around and you'll see a soft gather. Now, as I'm coming to the very end, I'm going to clip off that starting thread chain. And as my knife approaches these beginning stitches, then I'm going to stop and lock my knife so it doesn't trim off any of the um, threads and cut them. So I'm going to slow down. Okay, I'm going to lock my knife. And I can just clip. I just overlapped a few little stitches. But can you see how that cups the edge under so perfectly? It's, it's just such a cool technique. I love this. That's great, Gail. It's such a, such a great little tip on doing a circular hem. And now that video is about a five minute video. So I thought maybe you could give us just a short synopsis of what else we would see in that particular video. Well, in that video, um, it's kind of funny how that started. My sister and her husband always come up to our house for the holidays and they stay with us for about a week. And they had just moved into a new house and um, she had a table top, I guess, on top of something. I don't know what it was, but she wanted um, a cover for it. So she had found fabric and um, she's not a sewer. So, um, I said, well, okay. And she wanted to use the serger. So I had this brainstorm that if she wanted a circular hem, I was going to turn the, um, differential feed up to 1.3. And I only typically when you gather something, you use a four thread overlock. You have the two overlock needles, your upper looper and your lower looper. But, um, in this particular technique, I only wanted a very soft gather, just enough to make the fabric cup over without getting any points or some of those little pleats that you get when you're doing a circular hem. So I used three threads um, and I just turned the differential feed. I think it was to 1.3 or 1.5. It, it says it in the video. I show how to do a little starting gait because a lot of times people wonder how to get a nice clean finish when you are going around in a circle. And I did that, I did a series of articles for Threads Magazine. And so I show how to do the starting gate, the differential feed setting. Again, I talk about all of the different settings for the stitch to achieve that technique. That's great. Now you sent me another one um, uh -huh. that is a, one of your longer ones. Let me show that clip okay. you know, as well fingers light touch you don't want to stretch your neckline you've worked hard on your pattern to get your neckline with a nice smooth close fit so it's very attractive when you're wearing it so we're going to try to maintain that as it's being stitched so and no daylight between the binding and the neckline you don't want to squish it up but you just want it kissing the inside of that binding The engineering on these is just amazing. 
and it's just incredible. Basically, the binding and the neckline know where they need to be under the foot. You don't have to watch your needles at all. Let me get my hand out of the way so you can see the magic. And again, I would like to make a sample first just to make sure everything's doing what it's supposed to do, but I have made samples so I can see from the back that it's doing exactly what I want it to do. Okay, so now Gail, that is an attachment I have never known about in my whole life. And I think it's called a knit binder attachment. It's the double fold knit bias binder attachment. That's right. And so, so can you it, give us a, a little synopsis of that video? I think that's about a 15 minute video, but can you, what we would learn in that? Yes, um, that one is um, one of the greatest little um, attachments. And it, 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 as I said in the video, the engineering on these things is amazing on the specialty feet and the attachments. And on the first one, it was an overlock technique. And on the double fold knit bias binder, it's a cover stitch um, technique. And so, that binder attaches to the cover stitch table on your machine. You have to kind of convert your machine over, or if you have a dedicated cover stitch machine, you can use it on that. And usually there are a couple of little screw holes on the bed of the machine on that little table that um, the attachment will screw into. And you just have to get it adjusted for whichever needles you're using. On that particular one, that was a 10 millimeter binder attachment. Um, I have three different ones. There's an eight millimeter that gives a very delicate, narrow binder, uh, 10 millimeter, which is very similar, if not exactly the same as what you see on ready to wear t-shirts and jerseys. Mm -hmm. And um, then there's a 15 millimeter that's a bolder and wider one, which I also love. And, um, but that technique does take, it does take a little bit of practice, but I do a um, hands-on workshop with all of these specialty feet. I use the ruffling foot, the cording foot, um, and then we switch over to cover stitch and we use the double fold binder. And it's amazing. And people are just blown away that with a little bit of guidance and some practice, they get the hang of it. And a lot of them go home with these cute little neckline samples that they did in class and they came out perfectly. And it's just a matter of being patient with yourself, doing a little bit of practicing and figuring things out. But um, one of the things that I think was so important with um, sergers that a lot of people never talked about was you have to make sure that your machine settings are correct for the fabric and the technique that you're doing, but how you handle the fabric when you're working with it is important. If, if um, people are pulling on their fabric and they've got their differential feet up to two, it's still gonna stretch. So I always say handy operator techniques and being aware of what your hands are doing. And that's why I mentioned that in the video of light fingers, light hands, don't stretch it. I love those attachments, I just love them. Well, um, I, as I told you when we chatted before the interview, my idea of using my serger is finishing seams on garments. So you uh -huh. definitely inspired me to consider some more options for my serger. <laughs> well, you know, when you had mentioned that, I said, I hear that virtually at every single in-person in-person surgery event that I do, whether it's at an expo or ASG conference, or I do a lot of ASG chapter events around the country. And inevitably, at least one person and usually multiple people will say, I only use my surgery to finish scenes. And so, and, and if that's all you want to do with it, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's fantastic for that. But um, if you want to do a little bit of experimenting and um, kind of widen your sewing repertoire and ability to do some different techniques, it's a wonderful machine to get the hang of. It really, I, I just love my surgery and I love having fun with it. That's great. So um, I always like to ask before I end these interviews, what's next on the horizon for Gail Yellen? 
Anything new coming up? Well, actually, I just launched um, an online class. It's called Serger Jewelry, Who Needs Tiffany's? And um, that's kind of fun. And I have a bunch of um, Serger bracelets that I did. I can actually show them to you. Do you want me to grab my board? I had this, I did a um, Facebook Live a couple of weeks ago when the class went live. And um, I had these pinned on to show. So I'll, you can kind oh, of see. Fun. Yeah, and that is actually using the belt loop binder on the serger. And um, I'm sorry, what kind of binder? It's called the belt loop binder. And I have a couple of different widths, and I use them for, I have my tote bag here. I just had it in the room because I was grabbing some stuff out of it. You can make beautiful straps with it on your tote bag. This is another newer pattern that I launched. But, um, that belt loop binder is really kind of fun for making jewelry too. Or um, I've had people who say, oh, I make my dog all sorts of fancy collars for the holidays or my cat or whatever. And um, so there are a lot of different things that you can do with that. Some people, believe it or not, the one thing I've never made with it is belt loops. But um, <laughs> I, I have made belts. I've made straps for my tote bag. I've made surgery jewelry. I've done all sorts of things with that. But um, it's fantastic. And I think depending on um, how long our um, isolation goes on or our social distancing, I think I'll probably do some more online classes. I have really enjoyed getting to know you more, to get to know more about the things that you do and teach. It has been an absolute delight. I don't want to miss telling our audience, if you are a member of American Sewing Guild and you go to the American Sewing Guild website under members only, you will find three different discount opportunities oh. that Gail offers to members. So take advantage of those and sa save a few bucks and, um, and get something fun from Gail. So Gail, thank you so much for joining me today. It truly has been a real treat and you have inspired me. I'm going to have to give some more things a try. So thanks. Well, I'm right here to be your cheerleader, Cheryl. And thank you so much again for doing this for all of the members and non-members too. And hopefully we'll get some new ones. Absolutely. You take care, stay safe, and stay healthy. Until next thanks time. Thanks so much, Cheryl. Thank you. tend to accumulate many spools of thread, each one bought to match a particular project. But you really don't need to match thread exactly for every seam. Instead of adding to your thread collection, keep an assortment of 8 to 10 neutral thread colors on hand. These colors, plus a couple of brights in hues you wear often, are all you need for most garment construction. In most cases, one of the neutral colors blends well with a solid or patterned fabric. Black, brown, and navy work on most dark colors, while white or off-white is suitable for many pastels. Try gray on mid-range greens and blues. It's even easier to camouflage thread on a multicolored print. Of course, for top stitching, treat yourself to thread that either matches perfectly or provides the kind of contrast you want. With this approach, you'll buy and store much less thread at the same time, you'll always have a color that goes with your project. doing applique at the machine. I have really enjoyed all of the decorative stitches that the Janome sewing machines offer. Not only do you have lots of beautiful ones that are more geometric or more simple or more elaborate, but you can also adjust the width and the length of the stitches on each to create a lot more variation than just a basic default stitch. When I'm doing applique for my quilt, a lot of times I'm doing raw edge applique, so I really like that extra security that the stitches with lots of different needle drops across the width of it can provide for applique. 
As you can see here, I have been playing with the different variations that any one stitch on this machine will give me. I've started by stitching out exactly how it is as a default and then have adjusted the width to make it a little bit more narrow, which you may want to do if you have smaller applique shapes. You may not want a really wide stitch on it. And then I've also made it even more narrow as well as decreased the stitch length to pack in the elements a little bit closer. And it's a really good idea as you're exploring the stitches to go ahead and make yourself a few samplers like this and maybe even take a pen and write out what settings you use so you could go back and use it as a reference guide. When I'm doing raw edge applique, again, I like to use something that's got lots of needle drops across the width, but something as simple as a blanket stitch or even this one here, it has a big wide stitch taken. So if you're doing a turned applique where you've got a secure folded under edge, this one would still keep the edge really neat and sewn. And when you're deciding on thread colors, sometimes I'll use the color of thread to stand out as another design element, and then other times I really want the stitch to kind of go away and blend into either my printed or my solid fabrics. Another adjustment that I can make to these decorative stitches is begin and end them with a tapering point instead of the full width of the stitch, which is really helpful when you're sewing down, say, a leaf shape with a pointed tip so that it doesn't go over the edge of the really fine tip of your shape. And I'm gonna do that now on this one. So as I approach where I started my tapered stitch, I'm gonna hit the lock stitch button so that it ends with a tapered stitch as well. So I have so many opportunities to explore all styles of stitches as well as getting them just right for my applique. Hello everyone, I'd like to introduce to you Terry and she is a co-host with the Special Interest Lingerie Group. And um, I'd like to ask uh, Terry, what do you like? What have you been enjoying about the lingerie group? Well, I for years have wanted to get into bra making. Um, I think like everyone else, we all have certain fit problems. Who's too big, who's too small, who's too wide, who's too high, who's too low. So I mentioned it to Sandy and she said, you know, I'm very interested in that. And of course, Sandy not only was interested, but knowledgeable, been there, done that, but we didn't know that. So we got a group of people together invited everyone but only about five or six responded and everyone is welcome to join us because some of us are still on the rudimentary elementary level with this product it's been into effect since last uh, september or so right sandy i yeah. don't remember we started it and we've been meeting um well we started at each other's homes then we got um meeting place at the library so we are very open to meeting anywhere we'll meet outdoors if we have to um, some people have taken off with the bra making. Debbie is part of the group, Sandy is uh, Paulette, and people have actually completed bras, absolutely gorgeous. I hope that at some point there'll be a show and tell for you to see it. Debbie is so funny, not only did she make bra and underwear, you know, this is COVID time, so you have time on your hands. She even made a, ma a matching mask, which I loved. So the bra making, I'm not progressing very well. I've had other things to do and uh, it's kind of on the back burner, but I have some cups cut out and I think I need some materials that I do not have. Uh, there's bra sites and there are special shops that sell just lingerie that give lots of information. So I encourage anybody to join our group. Again, many of us are at the very early stages of it. So you come in now, you haven't missed too much. It's fun, and I think it's something that I'm going to love, and I'm going to have a product someday. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and our next meeting will be in July. I believe it's July 30th off the top of my head, but you can check the website. And um, before Terry and I started the interview, we were talking a little bit, and she mentioned about her interest in embroidery, which would be a wonderful not, uh, not second special interest group. So um, if you are interested in that, give your neighborhood group leader or Lua call and say you're interested in a special embroidery group and we'll see what we can get going. So um, Terry, you're also our Sunshine Chair. Do you want to talk to people about that program? Sure. Um, Sunshine, when I first took over the um, position, I, I received a lot of, of calls and a lot of emails from other members sent this one a card and, and the reason why and this one, the, you know, maybe some Sunshine and the reason why. 
And some days it would be, some weeks it would be three in a week. Now we have COVID and we would anticipate that we would have lots of uh, sunshine greetings to give out, but I haven't received one in maybe two months. And that's good news, I hope. I hope it's not because people are too sick to let everybody know that they're sick. But uh, I, I like when I don't get that kind of information. But sometimes we should get happy information too to share. It doesn't only have to be, let's get well. Um, hey, I kn we have an older group, but somebody's pregnant, somebody's getting married, uh, someone's doing, you know, that would also add sunshine to people's lives too. We can, we can send congratulatory messages too. So not only um, unfortunate things like, you know, being ill or surgery, but anything, any news that somebody, would benefit from a card, I, I think would be good. I uh, Email me, email anybody and they'll get to me. Uh, but it's in the, we're in the, the newsletter. My name and number is in there. So just email, even phone call, text, anything. And those of you that are with us live on Zoom, you'll see a chat window and I've typed in there uh, Terry's email address so you can reach out to her on that. And um, She's also available by phone, and you can call myself, your neighbor group leader, Lou, and we'll get you in touch with Terry if you don't have the information. Well, thank you very much, Terry. That was wonderful. Thanks for joining us. I enjoyed it. This is a wonderful meeting, and you are phenomenal, Sandy, what you're doing for this group. You are the glue that's holding us together right now, and everyone's learning from you and taking all the with it, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Have a great day. You too. Uh-huh, bye. talk to you a little bit about one of my favorite websites and it's called patternreview.com. I've been on this site for probably oh since 2008 and every morning I get a daily digest and here's a sample of one of them and the digest is composed of messages, classifieds, sewing machine reviews and re reviews of patterns and this is what people have made in the last 24 hours. Let's see if I can expand this just a little bit for you. There you go. So um, what I like is it's actual people wearing the patterns that they sewed up, or in some cases making their own patterns and sewing it up and showing it to you. And it's so much different than um, to see it on a person than it is to see it on a pattern envelope. As you can see, it also includes home deck, quilts, 
Um, there's masks being made, ba bibs, um, baby clothes, pet clothes, anything you can imagine. And um, they have a very robust uh, machine review, embroidery machines, regular machines, and expensive ones, top of the line, sergers, uh, sashiko, you name it, there's a review on it. And it's the review's done by people, just like you and me. Nobody's paid, and it gives you some of the um, behind-the-scenes looks from the user's point of view. They also have a classified section if you join Pattern Review. Um, it's $20 a year, or maybe it's $29 now, I can't remember exactly. But um, you have the ability to post um, sales and classifieds and list uh, information to buy and sell things at a, um, a level in an area that you can trust that's um, somewhat vetted. So this, this site has been, for the most part, I haven't seen any abuse like you can get on some of the other sites like Facebook and Craigslist and those things. So um, we're going to actually go to the site. Let's see if there is something interesting here. All right, what's the difference in Ponte Roma blends? So you click on that link in your email, again, the daily email box, or you go to the website. But this is how I enter it. And I'm not signed in because I wanted to give you um, a viewpoint of what you look like when you're not signed in. And um, here's a sample of people that, the lady that posted about wondering what the, um, what it meant by a Ponte Roma blend and a Rayon Ponte Roma blend. And we have some very knowledgeable um, educators on this forum, and they can go into all kinds of deals. Kale is one of these um, that is very um, good about explaining fabric contents and how to um, uh, determine what kind of fabric you have in your stash that you may have forgotten what the content is. So that is that. And as I, I said, they, they have contests if you're interested in sewing things. Um, the looks like the t-shirt contest is going on right now through June 30th. You can join that one. And um, let's see, there, there's a gallery of what people have been making for the t-shirt contest. So yeah, this is what people are doing now to make things for the contest. So it's a very interactive group. Like I say, um, wide variety of things. There's reviews on books and websites and stores and um, reviews on classes that you take, whether it's a national class or you saw class you took at Expo or a class you took on the website, all kinds of things. Um, shopping is there. You can buy patterns directly from them. Digital patterns that appear or they mail them to you with a mem if you're a member you get a discount. They have online classes. As I said, they have a lot of different machine reviews of different categories of machines and the stores that sell them, the dealership reviews. And um, you can track information if you want to track a particular topic, you can you can do that. And um, then there's the knowledge base and the contest and then they have a blog and we're a very very robust search engine so thank you for letting me share one of my favorite web websites today all right um again jan malai has our uh, uh information about Reporting community service, it's very important for our chapter to know how much uh, community service we've been doing. Uh, right now, she has uh, collected 871 masks that were made or information about 871 masks. I happen to know that <clears throat> one of my members in Anything Sews made 150 more masks, so we're looking at 1,000 right there. Are close to a thousand and I know that there are other people that have made masks for family and friends that you have not uh, turned in your report. Some of the places that have um, reaped the benefits of our mask mating, making is Pines of Sarasota and some other neighborhood uh, nursing or assisted living uh, places. Uh, I actually have a sister that's in assisted living in Virginia Beach and I, I sent them 30 masks and um, I have a hair salon I've been going to for years and uh, 
I make masks for the, everybody in the hair, uh, hair salon. So there are other places that need masks that are not necessarily um, health uh, uh, assisted living in those kind of places. And of course, family and friends, I know all of you have done that. Hospice of Sarasota and Charlotte counties, the Sarasota Sheriff Department, and Venice Hospital. These are places that have been reported. Um, Again, if you haven't sent in any information, please do so. That helps us understand and appreciate the amount of community service that has been uh, done in the last three months. And it's always done yearly. We always have a lot of information about uh, quilts and things that are done as well. Next, I'd like to show you one of my favorite blogs. It's called SoGuy.com, and I really enjoy this because it explains to me um, fabrics. And I'm just overwhelmed by the numbers of fabrics and all their different names. And if I'm confused about what I'm seeing before I buy something, this is a great place to go and figure out what it is I'm looking for. She starts out by explaining the different types of fabrics and choosing fabrics, and she has a complete reference guide to help you figure out what you're looking for in the way of fabrics. She not only has the icons that take you there very quickly, but she also has um, a table that goes by fabric category with the different names that those that you're looking for, the names of the fabrics. You know, if you're looking for a woven, a lightweight woven, would it be batiste, chiffon, net, that type of thing. If you're looking for a medium heavyweight knit, is it a double fleece? Okay. So that's one way it helps. And the other way is looking for names. So say I my project calls for um, a medium weight fabric and I'm looking for the sales and I see that it I have a <clears throat> it's described as a poplin or a damask or a um, gingham. I don't know what if that's going to be appropriate. So I could go here and search for what it is and then I'm I'm looking at it and it says, okay. Well, the poplin and the, the gingham and raw silk, those all fall into medium weight fabrics. So yeah, maybe that would be something that um, if I have in my stash, that would be suitable for that particular project I'm making. So not only that, but she um, goes on further and gives you so many different names. Sometimes we will see the exact same fabric or what it looks like to us would be the exact same fabric but the name is listed differently, or a name we've never heard it listed under before. It's like, well, what is that name? We, in today's world, a lot of the manufacturers, when they're competitive, they're, they name their own types of fabrics or propriety fabric types. And so it makes it difficult when you're trying to buy a fabric to know if that name is a name that you, rec is that fabric is under a name that you are familiar with, but it's just a strange name for what you normally think of. So um, on the bottom part of her website, as you scroll down, you will see that she furthermore defines each of those names. So something as obtuse as an Angora fiber, I can see that that is a product from um, incredibly soft hair of an Angora rabbit. And it's different from the mohair, which comes from an Angora goat. So they're both Angora. The Angora category, it not only tells me what an Angora type fabric is, but whether it comes from the rabbit or the goat is something I might want to um, know when I'm buying it. Um, and then she also says used to make sweaters and accessories. So there's a use for that fabric. And um, I hate, I'm not going to spend a lot of time discussing each one of these fabrics, but hold on to your horses. Here we go. <laughs> this is going to make you a little bit dizzy, but, <laughs> and we are only in the T's. Okay. Well, that wasn't too bad. So again, I hope you enjoy it. And um, if you have any fabric questions, head on over to SoGuide.com. 
This next tip is about using tablets and iPads. And um, I wanted to show you, okay, so I searched on the website for organic fabrics and I saved it as a, um, a little page on my tablet. And I wanted to show you how I organize things. So I have got, I've made little folders. And so I can go into my folders and I want a fabric. I have one of classes. And since I do PR, I showed you that website, Pattern Review. I have a lot of classes on there that I use. But I also have one that's um, just sewing related. So um, this is a, a large category for me to scroll through. And I got so many um, sewing related things that I needed to break it down to another folder. So what you can do is you can take um, two of these things and if you merge two things together it will make let you make another folder. So I'm not going to do that now because I already have an existing folder and you can rename it to whatever you want that just showed up as bookmarks. But I had made this one of fabric so I just take my little home saved a home little icons there and I put them in one and I call it fabrics and now I can easily on my um, tablet I'm not looking for um, little single things I've got them all grouped by categories and I can make on any category I want and call it anything I want so that's my tip for organizing little website holders on into folders on your tablet I'd like to talk to you about the upcoming ASG contest. If you go to the tab under resources, you will see um, contests. Click on that and it will take you to the anyone can win contest. Um, pretty simple. There's two categories, members over 18 and junior members that are 18 and younger. They'll receive a one year membership to the university fashion and junior members will see, receive a hundred dollars gift certificate to Nancy Notions plus a one-year ASG junior membership and second place winners will also have something. You can click on any of those patterns that you're seeing on the screen. There are all simplicity patterns and any one of them can be entered into the contest. If you click on one, we'll take one here, you'll see that you can get a bigger image. So that's all you need to do to see it enlarged. And I think we're almost to the end here. So don't get too dizzy. I'm going to scroll my way back up a little faster this time. There's no easy way to get to the other side of things if I don't scroll up. So um, there is some kind of an entry category. Here it is. It's right here. Enter now. I'm going to enter. And to enter, you are going to need to um, type in your um, let's see email and password. Okay, now you're in the members only section. And there's an entry form here link, the information we just saw. And there's the entry form link. And then you just fill in your information. And select if you're over 18 or a junior member, or even non-members can enter the contest. And then you'll explain what you're making and your pattern number in a brief description. And this year, um, you'll have to send them a con an image of what you're making. Choose the file and upload it and then submit and you're done. And that's how you enter the ASG contest. Thank you. As we have a sewing challenge, fabric challenge for our annual meeting and we're doing solid color 
um, items. You can do a solid color garment. You can do a color block garment. Uh, we want solid colors versus no patterns. I have, if you look behind me, and you'll see the star quilt that I made several years ago, actually. And it is all done in solid colors. And I wish I could get closer for you, but I'm not very adept. I also have a Mandela on the other side, which is uh, all done in solid colors. The people think solid colors, that's kind of boring, but you will be uh, surprised at what you can come up with in working with solid colors. I think they're also easier at this particular point to go online and find some solid colors. And I know uh, So Worth It has a bunch. And I don't know, I think I'm soon must be open because I drove by there and I saw Carl's at cars out front um, at that particular store as well. I know uh, Cotton Patch is not open per se, but they are online and you can order online. I actually uh, made another one that, um, if I can share, let me see if I can find it, share the screen. Well, I'll learn how to do that, but I did show you two examples of solid. And I hope that you will go through your stash and be able to find uh, material that you can make uh, uh, something in solid colors. And I got this idea from the patchwork quilters up in uh, uh, Manatee County. And you would not believe there was absolutely some beautiful quilting done, but I know that you can do it in totes, you can do it in purses, you can do it in all kinds of variety of things. And we have actually three categories. One is quilts, one is um, projects, and one is garment sewing. And uh, we'll be showing our, um, the efforts of our sewing at the annual meeting. I would like to show you is a visit to our chapter's website and on our website we have a list of all the upcoming meetings. In June our neighborhood groups have met just because they wanted to meet and greet see each other. We haven't seen each other in a long time. In July we're going to be doing more about screen sharing so if you have a photo of something you've been working on or you want to share a tip or a tool or a blog or website that you like I'll show you how to do that in Zoom by sharing your screen. We've restarted our chapter programs. Today's the first one of the summer. And um, you have two opportunities uh, to participate. You can log into your Zoom application or browser link. And um, if you log into Zoom and watch this meeting, you'll be able to um, ask comments and questions and post, chat, post things to the chat live with um, the other people that are on Zoom with us today. For those of you that are a little bit hesitant about using Zoom, you will be getting an email with a link to the recording for today's program. And it, when you get that email, just click on that link and it'll play the movie. There's nothing that you have to join, just watch the movie. So that's two ways to enjoy what we're rolling out to you this summer during our inability to meet in person. If you scroll down to the bottom of the web page, you'll see our calendar. And for example, this is today's meeting on the 17th, once a month, Wednesdays. And if you want to join Anything Sews, you would just click on that little tab and click on that link. And when you do, Zoom will open up and you'll be able to join that meeting. So that's an easy way to go. Find different things. So our next meeting will be on July 15th. We'll have another program just like today. And if you want to join at 10 o'clock on July 15th, Go to our homepage, go down to the calendar, and this one isn't interactive for some reason, so just copy this one and um, do a copy and then paste it in your browser and you're good to go. You'll be able to join us for Zoom. Well, that takes care of our tips and tricks for the website and a little bit about what we've got planned for you this summer. Ladies, I cannot do this without Sandy. She has been a rock. She's, she's just, she just answers all my questions and uh, I could not do this at all without her. She's fantastic. And I'm gonna give her a big hand. 
I really, really appreciate everything that she does for our chapter. It's amazing. Um, Oh, I had two people that wanted to, uh, were interested in an embroidery special interest group. And so if you are interested or know somebody that might be, um, email us and uh, Sandy or me, and we'll see what we can do about getting an uh, embroidery group, uh, special interest group together. I want to thank you all for showing up today. I truly appreciate it. And uh, we're going to make it through this and I'm glad to see your faces and know what's going on with you as well. And we will be doing anything says we'll have their uh, group meeting on Saturday morning and you're more than welcome to join us on our Zoom for Saturday. I know Creative Sassy Sewers is also meeting at their regular day and so is um, uh, Pins and Needles, right? So. Enjoy, have a good week, stay well, and uh, don't believe all this that you can go out and do anything you want to because you can't, <laughs> but do stay, stay safe.